creating this uh, let's put right life uh, experiences uh, of wildlife veterinarians and this is the uh, eight, ninth webinar series webinar conducted uh, in the third international webinar series by sri lanka veterinary association uh, thank you all of you uh, allocating the time for joining this webinar. And also, especially I would like to thank today's resource person, Dr. Dinusha De Silva, wildlife veterinarian in the Department of Wildlife Conservation. She has more than seven years experience in the field. And also uh, she's uh, treat more than 600 wildlife cases uh, per year, uh, ranging from the lorries to wild elephants. And I think uh, we will have a very fruitful session today uh, sharing her experience with, with her sharing experience. And also I would like to thank today's moderator, Dr. Tarindi Ka Prasadini, uh, for accepting the uh, accepting for moderating the session. And uh, she's also a lecturer in attached to the uh, Veterinary Clinical Sciences Faculty of Veterinary Medicine and Animal Science. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tarindika, and floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dilan, sir, and Dr. Suga. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the audience around the world. I am honored to moderate you today's discussion on re rehabilitating rescued wildlife experience of wildlife veterinarian of third international webinar series organized by Sri Lanka Veterinary Association. Today, our guest speaker is Dr. Dinu Shadi Silva. Dr. Dino Shah, actually, who doesn't want an introduction, but it is my pleasure to welcome her and introduce her to the audience. Dr. Dino Shah is a wildlife veterinary surgeon attached to the Department of Wildlife Conservation in Sri Lanka. Currently, she works as the veterinary surgeon in charge of the Wildlife Health Management Center in Girthale, which is the second largest wild animal hospital in Sri Lanka where she carries out in-house and field treatments. On average, per year, she treats about 600 wild animals, ranging from lorries to elephants. One of her main interests and specialties is the rehabilitation of injured and orphaned wild animals. Dr. Dino Shah completed her veterinary degree from the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine and Animal Science, University of Peradeni in Sri Lanka, followed by her master's degree in wildlife conservation from the same university. After graduating, she worked with domestic animals in veterinary hospitals to gain extensive skills as a veterinary surgeon at the beginning. Also, she worked in elephant transit home in 2015 and 2016 as a wildlife veterinary surgeon, gaining essential skills and knowledge in managing orphan elephants. She received an international training in wild animal health management from the College of Af African Wildlife Management in 2019. Dr. Dino Shah also worked as an external lecturer teaching wildlife diplomats in wildlife health and conservation medicine at the University of Colombo. Very recently, she was awarded as one of the best young veterinarians in Sark region by the Sark Regional Veterinary Association in 2023. Without further ado, I'll hand over to our resource person. Over to you, Dr. Dinusha. Dr. Dinusha? Uh, yes, Dr. Tarindi. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all my colleagues joining the webinar across the globe. And thank you, Dr. Tanindi, for your introduction. Uh, I am Dr. Dinusha. Uh, currently, I work as a wildlife veterinarian uh, in Department of Wildlife Conservation, Sri Lanka. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to talk about rehabilitating rescued wildlife uh, of, uh, from Sri Lankan perspectives. So uh, let me start my presentation. Hope you all uh, my presentation and hope you all can hear, hear me clearly. So let's move. Yes, Dr. Dinesha, we can see your screen as well as uh, your voice. We can hear your voice. Yes. Okay, Dr. Dinesha, thank you. Uh, let me start my presentation by introducing the concept of wildlife rehabilitation. Uh, what is wildlife rehabilitation? Uh, it is the act of providing temporary care for sick, injured, or open wildlife uh, and we do not stop from there. 
the main goal is to release them back to their natural environment. Before we release them back, we make sure these rehabilitated animals will function like true wild animals. It means they should find uh, their natural food, uh, they should socialize uh, with uh, individuals of their own species, and they should mate and reproduce. Sometimes uh, there is a concern amongst some people. What is the point of spending resources and time on injured individual? They think it's just one animal and you do not need to worry. But individual health matters. Individuals create population and healthy population are critical for good ecosystem health. Wildlife rehabilitators are typically motivated by different reasons. For me, there are three main motivations. First one is sense of compassion. You have to feel the pain of the sick animals. Then animal welfare. They have equal right to live and share resources. Third one is wildlife veterinarians are conservationists. They contribute overall conservation of species silently. Okay, let's find out why we have to rehabilitate wild animals. I guess you all are aware of the fact that most of our wild animals, especially large mammals, are having negative interaction with humans called human-wildlife conflict. As a result, wild animals get injured or become open frequently. So we have the responsibility of rehabilitation of these animals and release them back to wild. And the other reason is to help conservation of threatened species and slow down the extinction. For example, Indian pangolins are prime target of hunters and killed in large numbers. It's an endangered species. So we put our maximum effort and resources to rehabilitate injured and open pangolins. Now, across the globe, people do care about injured, sick, and open wild animals. So there are a lot of rehabilitation centers, private and government, especially in countries like USA and Australia. Uh, even our neighbor country, India, has some very best wild animal rehabilitation centers, such as Wildlife SOS and Wildlife Trust of India. But in Sri Lanka, only the Department of uh, Wildlife Conservation has the authority to rescue and rehabilitate wild animals. In the department, we have three wildlife hospitals and six wildlife health management centers. There are only 16 wildlife veterinary surgeons working in these centers under the supervision of the Director of Wildlife Health. You can see in the map uh, where, where our hospitals, hospitals and uh, health management centers are located. I need to highlight this factor as there are some people work as wildlife rehabilitators in Sri Lanka. Uh, in other countries, wildlife lovers can pass examinations and obtain license to become a wildlife rehabilitator. But in Sri Lanka, we don't have a such system like that. In Sri Lanka, wildlife rehabilitation can be only carried out under the supervision of veterinary surgeon in Department of Wildlife Conservation. It's illegal to keep wildlife in human settings. You will harm the animals rather than helping them. Your effort may end up with aspiration pneumonia or intolerance diarrhea. There's a good chance of having zoonotic diseases like rabies. Abusive animals may initiate human wildlife conflict in future. Being a wildlife pet in Sri Lanka is an extremely exhausting job. <laughs> Let me share our experience. Uh, it's a 24-7 it's a day and night profession. Even we have, to, we have scheduled day work hours. Uh, we work unlimitedly for extra hours without getting paid for those extra hours. When wild animals is in need, we get ready. As you saw previously, only 16 vets have to cover the whole island. Hence, it is an extremely exhausting work. 
sometimes it's painful and emotional. The supper, we suffer the pain of the animal with it. The horrific suffering that we see make us stress. Yet you have to be positive and energetic for next helpless wild animal that come to our care. Of course, there are some joyful locations. When we release animal back to the wild after rehabilitating them successfully, it's extremely happy. Let me talk about the types of animals we receive. We get variety of animals from lorises to elephants because Sri Lanka has high biodiversity and host large number of wild animal species. Also, we get animals at different life stages from infant to adult, as you can see in the pictures. Further, we received animals subjected to different causes such as sick, injured, and open. When should wild animals be brought to rehabilitation? We receive open infants, wounded or sick animals, and debilitated animals. When it comes to open animals, they should be truly opened because wild animals leave their youngsters along in the places while they are going out for foraging and hunting. When people spot them, they think youngsters are abandoned and try to be bring them to wildlife officers. When an animal is brought to our center, we immediately take measures to minimize the stress of the patient. We assess the potential of releasing back to wild after rehabilitation. I will explain this with examples in later slides. And also we need to make sure our patients are not a danger to ourselves. Uh, these are the most common causes of uh, admissions, spinal injury and head injury due to accidents, animal bites, fractures, mostly in birds, and open animals. Let's talk about triage. So what is triage? Triage is a system of sorting and prioritizing patients to maximize number of survivors. In here, survivors means who can be successfully released back to the wild. So how do we make triage decision in wildlife rehabilitation? It is different from human medicine. In human medicine, patients with worse injuries being treated first. Same procedure may be followed in pet animal practice. However, in wild animal treatments, least ill patient get priority and it gets treated first. This is called reverse triage. By doing this, we try to make sure we will use our limited resources meaningfully and increase the number of survivors. Further into concept of triage, do, why do we protect uh, practice? Why do we practice uh, reverse triage? It's to uh, protect our limited resources uh, and because we have to manage our limited resources such as money, time and human resources and should get maximum of, out of it. The other main factor that we consider in decision making is the quality of life of the patient after treatment. What do you think about a wildlife patient who is going to live as a permanent disabled? As example, in this picture, you can see Asian open bill with complete limb fractures. In order to save its life, we have to amputate both legs. What do you think? I leave the question for you. But there are some exceptional cases such as rehabilitation of threatened individuals. We will make full effort to save them even though we know chance of success is less. Let's move on to uh, next slide. How do we approach wildlife cases? This involves five steps. As in normal practice, uh, first we take history. Uh, there we, uh, then we perform hands-off examination stage one. Uh, we call it in the box examination. Then hands-off examination uh, stage two, we call it out of the box examination. And then hands-on examination. 
it should be uh, it should do quickly uh, preferably, preferably within 15 to uh, 5 to 15 seconds uh, if the patient is not anesthetized and uh, this is to minimize patient stress uh, which could be fatal for the patient in uh, for the wildlife patients finally we can decide whether we are going to treat euthanize or hand rear the patient. Taking history is the first step. Rarely we get detailed history about the case because wild animals don't have owners. Usually the collector would say of an animal, unable to fly, unable to walk, uh, found from the ground, likewise. Hence we ask some questions to get more details. Where did you find it? How did you get it? Did you feed it? Did it attack you? Did you treat it prior admission? By doing that, we develop the history of the patient. Let's move on to some cases to explain how we approach wildlife cases. This black naped hair was presented to our hospital recently. Uh, village has found it, uh, according to him, this hair was attacked by a mongoose and it couldn't move. Rescuer did not feed the hair or no treatments done before admission to wildlife hospital. So that's the history of the case. So this is the hands of uh, examination stage one uh, in the box examination. We did not move, remove the animal from the box. We did not touch him and just performed visual examination. Here you can see stressed patient. You can clearly see uh, ear position of the hair. Uh, here you can see uh, abnormal hind limb position, hind right limb, you can see it's abnormal position. And here you can see uh, laceration wound around shoulder joint. So the next step is hand of, hands of examination stage two. So it we called uh, out of the box examination, uh, where we keep animal in an open area and observe its movement. So this juvenile hair did not move and tried to crouch in one place. Here you can clearly see the laceration uh, in uh, left shoulder joint. So then we did the hands-on examination and. As you can see here, it revealed that there was an open fracture at trasocrural joint. Uh, so, uh, now it's time to decision making. We ask these questions. Can we fix the fracture? Would amputation be a good solution? Can it gain its natural behavior after treatments? Are we going to use available limited resources on this animal, knowing the fact that we can't release it back to the wild? You know, hares need strong limb, limbs to run fast and avoid predator pressure in wild. So hair with weak limbs would not survive in the wild. Are we going to use available limited resources? So what do you think? Treat or euthanasia, what's your opinion? So this is the second case which I selected. It is an adult Shahin Falcon. So let's take its history. Uh, according to the wildlife officers who found, uh, it was on the ground and unable to fly. Uh, no visible wounds noticed, but some sort of abnormality in the right wing. They tried to release it back, but the bird didn't move. It was not feed. Uh, they had applied uh, some Ayurvedic balm on the abnormal wing. It means right wing. So that's the history. During hands off examination stage one, we noticed it couldn't fly and just sat in the box, not trying to come out from the box and uh, it also looked very stressed. Uh, during the hands-off examination, stage two, out-of-the-box examination, 
uh, tried to fly out but could not take off. Uh, the, the right wing had less range of motion than the left one, did not open the right wing as much as it opened the left wing. So during hands of examination, uh, here you can see, uh, you can compare left shoulder area and uh, right shoulder area. Here in the uh, right side, you can see feathers look uh, messy. Also the tip of the last primary feathers of right wing were damaged indicating abnormal position of the wing. Next step is diagnosis. With a radiograph, it will be very easy. But in my center, we don't have an X-ray machine. When necessary, we have to collect portable machine from Colombo, but it would take a couple of days. Can't we diagnose without a radiograph? So that's what we did. Here we managed to palpate the abnormal right wing, and uh, these are my findings. Uh, right shoulder joint was edematous, warm, no crepitation, painful for the bird when touching. There is no visible soft tissue damage. According to those findings, uh, my differential diagnosis are shoulder joint luxation or coracoid luxation of the keel. So with this diagnosis information, I deci decided to proceed with the treatment as Shaheen Falcon is a scarce resident bird and they are found in restricted areas in Sri Lanka. Even though uh, the chance of recovery is limited, I uh, decided to treat. After first stage treatment, we have to do uh, lots of physiotherapy uh, and there's a risk of having uh, arthritis in future and uh, sometimes risk of having reduced motion range of right wing which will not allow you to release it back to wild. So this is, uh, this is the treatment we did. We applied wing bandage to uh, restrict the movements of damaged wing. Uh, these are the medications I'm using currently, ketoprofen uh, for first three days, and clintamycin is continuing up to uh, 14 days. He is still under our care. Uh, so our next next case is a juvenile Asian elephant. Uh, it was about uh, three months old. Uh, female calf found from Valikanda area of Polonnaruwa. Uh, we named her as Nikini. So during hands of examination, I observed uh, it's having abnormal gait. Uh, it showed difficulty in walking. Uh, and notice wounded and swollen left falling. During the hands-on examination after sedation, we found a uh, metal snare around left uh, falling carpal area. Uh, metal wire was tightly embedded into muscles up to the bones, uh, severe infected wound, and uh, Wound size uh, is uh, length is about 15 centimeters, width, width is about 5 centimeters, and uh, depth is about 5.5 centimeters. Uh, poor weight bearing of uh, left falling uh, and abnormal gait also observed. So we uh, decided to treat this uh, juvenile elephant. Uh, but uh, there are some limiting factors uh, to clean such deep wound. We have to uh, sedate uh, the animal. But is it possible to sedate this kind of juvenile animal daily for wound cleaning? Uh, you all know it's not a possible thing. As a result, uh, I decided to take different pathway to treat this pa uh, patient. Uh, a low cost, non invasive, uh, natural remedy, Kyle Pylanthus reticulatus. Uh, hope our Indian colleagues are more familiar with this plant uh, since uh, Kyle is used in India to treat even for human wounds. Uh, 
uh, chyle has following properties uh, analgesic anti-inflammatory edema inhibition and hypertonic it enhances detriment absorption and protection give protection against microbial proliferation so instead of sedating this baby elephant daily we treated this elephant with uh, chyla paste so uh, this is how we prepared chyla paste it's very uh, low cost and simple method we used uh, about five, uh, 500 grams of chyla leaves and 200 milliliters of water and uh, ground it using simple kitchen uh, grinder to make a smooth paste and uh, we can store uh, prepared paste up to four days in refrigerator. So uh, after cleaning the wound with uh, lukewarm water and normal saline, we applied uh, Kyla paste uh, on the wound and covered with ghost bandage and coban bandage. You can clearly see how we did the cleaning and application of the paste. So, here you can see the prognosis uh, after 10th week uh, from the initial treatment. You can see a little scar here. This is the summary of uh, antibiotic and analgesics we use during treatments. Uh, next uh, case is uh, about uh, an adult fishing cat. This fishing cat was uh, brought to the hospital uh, after met with a road accident. Uh, by the time people found it, it was unconscious and looked almost dead. Uh, so after receiving the uh, patient, we did emergency treatments and uh, changed into a smaller cage uh, for the EC examination and uh, treatments. Unlike other cases, uh, here we can't perform hands-on examination without sedation. Uh, but the patient was not stable for sedation. So based on hands-off examination, we started uh, treatments. So our differential diagnosis uh, were a head trauma and left polyp shoulder joint laxation. So uh, we start uh, started treatments with dexamethasone and cefotaxime, and uh, we uh, gave cefotaxime uh, for two weeks. And in this kind of uh, case, uh, proper management is also needed for uh, recovery of the injured animal. Uh, we have to hand feed animal during first two weeks. Uh, for the easiness of uh, handling, we kept him in a small cage. Uh, I know it's kind of stressful condition for animal, but we kept the cage in a silent area with, uh, with minimal disturbances. Uh, so uh, the other uh, thing, uh, other purpose of keeping him in a smaller cage is uh, to prevent further damages, uh, prevent movements and prevent further damages to luxated joint. Uh, after three days of admission, we uh, sedated uh, our patient and uh, we performed hands-on examination. Uh, during this examination, we found no fractures. Uh, by palpating and moving the uh, joints and uh, limbs, we uh, assessed that. Uh, we continued the treatment, uh, as I told, we continued the treatment for uh, another 11 days, totally 14 days. And then we transferred it to a bigger enclosure and uh, we uh, continuous monitoring of the patient. Uh, so this is uh, one, month, one month after admission. You can see uh, he's uh, doing well. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the happy moment. Here you can see how we released him and its reaction. He is moving so fast. So uh, 
I guess you saw in the video how it showed its natural behavior, uh, natural fear to human. That is something we try to maintain during our rehabilitation process. Uh, we actually released him to same area where he uh, was found injured. Uh, since it's a male animal, he has a territory. So we thought it's better to release him back to the, his original location. Uh, this is my final case. Uh, it is uh, an orphan fishing cat kitten. Uh, a villager found this orphan fishing cat kitten. This person actually uh, tried to find its mother, but no signs of the mom. So he handed over the kitten to the DWC officers. Uh, it was not fed before the admission. Uh, when I did hands off examination, I found it was active, but stressed as it was seeking its mother. During hands on examination, uh, I uh, found that uh, the juvenile kitten was dehydrated uh, and uh, we didn't find any external parasites. There's no wounds. Uh, incisor teeth erupted, uh, so we guess uh, he was about one month old, and it's uh, a male kitten. Uh, hence, uh, it's an endangered species, and it has a high chance of getting released back to the wild. After rehabilitation, we started to hand rear it, so um, we fed uh, it with uh, milk, but uh, not, uh, not like this. We didn't uh, have appropriate milk replacers, uh, like uh, species-specific milk replacers. Uh, so we use uh, locally available kitten milk replacers. And sometimes we use uh, sterilized uh, fresh cow milk. Uh, preferably, I use unbeable brand because uh, it gave uh, it it has given us a good results. Uh, so for that fresh milk, we had uh, supplements uh, like calcium and vitamins, and uh, we had boiled chicken breast uh, after grinding to the fine pieces. Uh, so that's how we uh, overcome the challenge. And I'm happy to say that uh, it gave us very good results. Uh, when it uh, comes to providing nursery care, uh, we have to provide proper heating because when they are with their mother, uh, they get uh, very good maternal care, warmth and protection. So we have to give uh, such ex that experience to the kitten. Uh, he should feel the uh, maternal care somehow, maybe not up, uh, surely not up to the natural level, but we should take care to give as much as possible care to uh, make him uh, feel better. Uh, and we have to provide uh, appropriate beddings. Uh, we have to make sure cleanliness at top level, because you all know uh, when it comes to even domestic cats, uh, they allowed to be uh, in a clean environment. It makes them uh, comfortable. So uh, also we uh, normally quarantine all the new kitten admissions to prevent contagious diseases such as a uh, feline leukemia virus. Uh, and we limit uh, human contact to prevent uh, the kitten getting habituated to humans. Uh, we uh, normally we assign one person to carry out feeding and cleaning. Uh, so uh, kitten was dewormed using pyrantel arm weight. Uh, during the rehabilitation process, we change uh, its enclosures according to its growth. Uh, soon after weaning, it was uh, transferred to stage two cage. Uh, as you can see uh, in the picture, uh, it is not completely open cage. There uh, we can, uh, familiarize the kitten to outside environment gradually. Uh, then it was transferred into a much bigger enclosure to gain full natural behavior. Uh, it spent its sub-adult stage and early adulthood in that enclosure. 
uh, being enriched the enclosure according to their natural habitats. Here you can see a uh, uh, pond uh, because fishing cats are uh, uh, always living near in marshes and uh, water bodies. So uh, accordingly, we enrich its uh, cage. When it comes to releasing stage, uh, we consider following factors, uh, size and the age of uh, animal, uh, and whether the animal shows a range of uh, its natural behavior, especially whether they have developed uh, fear on human. And we need to make sure that rehabilitated animal can identify their natural food. Uh, body condition should be uh, ideal. Uh, and uh, finally, we have to decide whether it's going to be a soft release or hard release. So rehabilitating an orphan animal uh, up to releasing stage is not a simple task. Now, uh, I want to draw your attention to the challenges I am facing uh, while working on wildlife rehabilitation. Uh, as uh, I mentioned previously, we have limited uh, staff, especially dedicated, skilled and trained staff are limited in our places. And lack of equipments. Uh, we don't have some sophisticated equipments, uh, but uh, it doesn't mean that uh, we are not uh, functioning without those. We are doing our best. Uh, you, I think you can remember without the without X-ray machine, we uh, perform our diagnosis. How we performed our diagnosis. So uh, the other thing is uh, it's dif uh, difficult in finding relevant milk replacers and uh, feeds in local market. But always we try to uh, make things using available resources and uh, for hand rearing still uh, we don't have proper nursery, nursery unit uh, so uh, it's a uh, for hand rearing small animals especially sensitive animals like uh, wild cats we need a separate nursery unit but still we don't have but we are doing uh, using available uh, resources uh, so, and the other thing is we don't have suitable vehicle for transporting animals uh, because uh, sometimes we have rescue and transport animals. And uh, on the other hand, we have to release animals to the, um, uh, especially during hard release activities. We have to uh, transport animals up to the local we selected to release them back. Uh, and the next challenge is a uh, public attitude. Uh, most of them think uh, the rehabilitation centers are animal display, display places. So we receive plenty of requests for observation visits. visits. Um, however, uh, most of them understand after we explain the situation. So uh, before wrapping up, my presentation, I have mentioned here some drugs only using for wild animals. There are many more, but here I am uh, mentioning uh, drugs I am using more commonly. Uh, so you can have a look, uh, drugs for raptors uh, and hares and rabbits uh, and for deer species uh, and for non-human primates. Uh, and for wild canids and for wild pellets. Uh, and this is a special thing I uh, would love to mention here. Uh, when you have uh, wild cats, uh, just like domestic cats, they are very sensitive for uh, chemicals and drugs. So when they have ectoparasitic infestations, there are uh, no option for us to uh, use as uh, parasiticide. So uh, always uh, this combination, uh, ivermectin diluted in normal water uh, gave us best result, not even in uh, wild cats, uh, even in uh, juvenile wild elephants uh, and all the other species, even birds, uh, it gave uh, best result. Uh, so 
And the other thing, if uh, you find uh, uh, often uh, juvenile cat with heavy ectoparasitic infestation, you can use a simple method uh, of using warm water and baby soap to uh, perform a, a total deep bath to uh, remove uh, ectoparasites. Uh, so with that, I'm going to conclude my presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Dinusha, for your informative talk. It contained lots of valuable information, and now the discussion is open for questions from the audience. If you have any questions, you can simply put the chat box, and I will direct them to Dr. Dinusha, or else you can directly ask by hand raising in. Uh, then we can accommodate you as well. Uh, we have got our first question from Madam Indira. Uh, it's about what's the Sinhalese word for Kaila leaves? Uh, it's the actually, madam, it's the Sinhala name. We call it Kaila. Uh, it uh, we can find it uh, around the water bodies in uh, uh, dry zone uh, area. Especially, it uh, considered as an invasive plant. Uh, here in Kowloon National Park, they even try to remove the Kaila plants. Uh, due to the invasive nature of the plant. The Kyla is the singular name for that plant. Uh, is that the plant that is overgrown at uh, Udwatta Kelly? Uh, I'm sure, seen uh, but uh, I have seen it uh, near the Mahavali River bank. It always uh, uh, appear adjacent to water bodies, just like tank beds uh, adjacent to... Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, thank you for the very nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from Dr. Arundhati. What is the chemical use of parasitic bath? How long you keep the animal in that bath? Uh, here, the chemical means we use just simple baby soap, any kind of baby soap, uh, so and warm water. So you can uh, dip the animal in the water and then uh, you can just uh, using a comb, you can uh, comb the hair. So uh, it maybe take 10 to 20 minutes to, uh, if the burden is heavy, it will take more time, but within 10 to 20 minutes, you can achieve the desired result. Well, thank you, Dr. Dinosha. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Ijaz. He's asking about the difference between hard and soft release. Uh, in soft release, uh, we release animal from the uh, uh, from the location where its uh, end enclosure is situated. But in hard release, we transport animal to a places uh, to a place where we decided it is best to release. It is uh, maybe a national park maybe a protected area, but it's unfamiliar to the animal. But in soft release, the area is familiar for the animal. So we prefer soft releases, but with the limited factors, sometimes we have to do so, uh, hard release. Dinesha, do you uh, monitor their uh, survival or their ability to get adjusted after your release? Yes, madam. Good question. Sometimes people tend to put uh, collars, uh, VHF and GPS collars, but uh, with small cats, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm, uh, I don't like to put uh, collars because they have very uh, less body weight. So maybe mm -hmm. the collar will appear a, a little harassment for that kind of uh, small wildcats. Uh, for in that sense, I'm using a, a camera traps to monitor animals by okay. using, yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, wildlife uh, department, what's the opinion of uh, using uh, chips, subterminal? Uh, 
for uh, elephants, they have used chips, but with the uh, intradermal chips, uh, you only can uh, identify animal when animal is uh, in your, uh, uh, your care. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. With collars, they can identify uh, for elephants. We put VHF and GPS collars, and we can get details from uh, uh, radio signals and GPS signals. Uh, with elephant, it's okay because they are massive animals, and uh, it's not a big deal to bear a, a 10 kg collar in their body. But when it comes to yeah. small animals, it's difficult for them. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, madam. Uh, we have another question from India. Dr. Manish is asking about is ivermectin injection diluted and applied all over the body? Yes, uh, that's the thing we are doing uh, because uh, in Sri Lanka we uh, can find ivermectin tablets and ivermectin injections and sprays. I think uh, it's not common, so we use. Uh, uh, the injectable solution and dilute it in normal water and use it as a spray. And there's another question from Dr. Arundhati. What sort of issues you have come across in giant squirrel? Uh, in giant squirrel, most common cases is dog bite. Uh, so with that, uh, the presentation uh, is always uh, about hind part paralysis. So, and the other common case is open uh, baby squirrels. Uh, with uh, spinal injuries, the success is very low, but uh, we hand rear open animals and we uh, successfully release them back to wild. And the next one is, uh, same as Kyla, Kyla, any other alternative herbs are you using for treatment wild animals? Uh, actually, currently we are using only uh, Kyla paste uh, because uh, we can use for many animals. Even in cats, you can apply it because it don't have any harmful effect. Uh, we haven't uh, come across it. So we only using uh, that plant as a natural remedy. And I think today's last question, have you ever successful in hard release of felines? Yes, plenty of. And there's another question, uh, do I deworm, do you deworm during your care period? The, I think uh, he's asking uh, whether we are deworming wild animals. Uh, when they are under, under your care yeah. yeah so it's a good question because uh, in the wild they don't receive uh, anti uh, parasitic drugs but uh, when it comes to open juvenile the first thing first we have to take care about the survival of the animal so we do initial deworming but after that uh, very rarely we deworm those animals because we train them to go back to the natural environment and survive in natural conditions. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's the last question. And again, thank you very much, Dr. Dinusha, for your informative talk. And there are a lot of thanking notes in the chat box, even though I could not read them one by one. With that, we wind up the session. Again, thank you, Dr. Dinusha, for her valuable time and dedication to make this session a success. Thank you, Dilansa, for inviting me to moderate this discussion. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And I would like to invite the Honorary Secretary of Sri Lanka Veterans Association, Dr. Kaundika Vanikasundara, to deliver the vote of thanks. Over to you, Dr. Kaudita. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tarindi. Uh, uh, I think we have completed a very successful webinar today. It, it was a very interesting uh, uh, type of uh, presentation. So this this will, will be the tenth of our webinar uh, of our international webinar series. The third. Uh, many participants have participated uh, through Zoom platform, and some have joined through uh, our uh, YouTube channel as well. So thank you very much, everybody. So on behalf of uh, Sri Lanka Veterinary Association, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to Dr. Dinusha Silva, Silva, veterinary surgeon, Department of uh, Wildlife Conservation, 
for accepting our invitation and conducting a very excellent presentation today on rehabilitating rescued wildlife. I think she has shared her experience as a wildlife veterinarian. It was very interesting. And uh, I have seen a lot of case studies, uh, which will definitely help uh, most of uh, the clinical veterinarians to improve their knowledge on wildlife. So thank you very much, Dr. Dinusha, once again, for your valuable contribution for today's uh, webinar. And also, I must thank uh, our moderator today, uh, Dr. Tarindi Pashadini, lecturer, Faculty of Veterinary Medicine and Animal Science, uh, University of Peradine, for doing a wonderful moderator. Uh, further, uh, I must thank uh, Dr. Sugat Premachandra, our Vice President, Sri Lanka Veterinary Association, for making all the arrangements for today's successful webinar. Uh, last uh, but not least, I must thank all the participants uh, who have uh, joined today from uh, around the country and also uh, overseas uh, uh, and actively participated despite of their busy schedules. So thank you very much, everybody, for uh, participating today's webinar. Uh, then I would like to make some announcement as well, uh, because we are will be having our next webinar on 10th September at the same time on cattle nutrition for better performance and economical feeding by Dr. Sagar Kumara. Hope uh, uh, most of you have, will join for that as well. So this is all for today's webinar. Uh, until we meet from our next webinar, it is goodbye to you all and have a wonderful day. Thank you very much.